Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome our distinguished guest today, Daniel Tutt. He's a writer, philosopher, and the host of Emancipation's podcast, which delves into the intersections of philosophy, psychoanalytic theory, and contemporary political struggles. Daniel's work is a rich blend of psychoanalysis and Marxist thought, and his first book, Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family, The Crisis of Initiation, published in 2022, seeks to invigorate the contemporary left by re-examining the family through these theoretical lenses. Daniel has an impressive academic background, having studied philosophy and psychoanalytic practice at American University and the European Graduate School. He has also imparted his knowledge at George Washington University, Marymount University, and even within the D.C. jail system. His research and writing covers a wide array of topics, including psychoanalysis and politics, Marxist theory, social reproduction debates, and the influence of Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism on contemporary thought. His latest book, How to Read Like a Parasite, Why the Left Got High on Nietzsche, explores the profound impact of Nietzsche's philosophy on the left, tracing its influence from the Black Panthers to contemporary liberal academics. Daniel's insights promise to offer a thought-provoking and engaging discussion, and we're thrilled to have him with us today. So welcome to the show. Great to be here. How are you? What's going on? Doing well, yeah. I'm trying to keep myself busy with the live streaming thing, and uh, it's uh, experimental at this point, but it's been interesting. How about you? Yeah, things are going well on my end. I've um, been doing a lot of podcasting myself. I'm working on a new book after the Par- after the Parasite book, uh, which you apparently just bought. I hope that you're enjoying it. I think you're not quite finished yet, right? Yeah, I've made a little bit of a dent, but... Uh, I still have plenty to get through. Yeah, so things have been well, you know, personally, uh, no complaints. And um, my research has uh, has really been, um, really been, I think, uh, you know, carving out some new paths. Part of what I've done is try to sort of bring about a sort of method of collective or public study. Uh, so whenever I pursue a new project, in Marxist study, which is my general area of research, is is Marxism, the kind of meaning of Marxism in the contemporary period, Um, which of course, when you say Marxism is your area of study, I think one of the beautiful things about Marxism is that it calls for this very wide interdisciplinary commitment on behalf of any engaged thinker, any engaged intellectual. You're forced to to wrestle with culture, to wrestle wrestle with literature, to wrestle with philosophy, to wrestle with sociology, with history, anthropology. And, you know, that also requires an understanding, I think, of um, of how one positions oneself in relationship to the academy, to the university. So that's actually a big focus of, of my work, which is to sort of analyze how political education can function towards the cause of building socialism in the 21st century. So I actually, okay. I actually think that that was a huge focus of Marx. So Marxism is kind of like an intellectual vocation. That doesn't mean that we need to have a fundamental hostility to the university, but we certainly, we certainly must have a certain very critical edge um, I think I, I've grown to see the limitations and the shortfalls of the academy in recent years, largely largely due to the post-2008 uh, austerity policies and the kind of the glut in humanities hiring and the terrible pay, the fact that it's a very exclusive milieu and culture. Those are some reasons, but I think there's other reasons, which is that academic knowledge, and here I would almost make a kind of historical claim, stretching back even to the Middle Ages, really, academic knowledge itself um, is not alone sufficient for galvanizing the kind of political agitation and political activity that I'm interested in. And it's interesting that tonight we're going to be talking about Jean-Paul Sartre, who himself, I would say, had a fundamental 
almost ontological hostility to the university. Yeah. Keep in mind that Sartre not only had a hostility to the university, but he had a hostility to bourgeois institutions writ large. I mean, he 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 turned down um, the Nobel Prize. I mean, he he turned down, oh, I think, multiple awards from from prestigious institutions on on political principles. <laughs> you know, he stood in solidarity with the Algerian cause. He stood in solidarity with the May sixty eight uprising of the students. So his political backbone is almost um of another time and we couldn't we couldn't really think of somebody in today's time exerting that kind of moral authority in my especially as a purely independent writer no right right yeah it's pretty unimaginable and as somebody who because I, I recently interviewed the uh, Hegelian philosopher Terry Pinkard on my show, and Terry Pinkard is actually a great Sartrean scholar. I don't know if you knew that. I, I, I was um, going to bring that up for sure sometime. Yeah, yeah. And well, one of the things that Terry Pinkard mentions is that um, Jean-Paul Sartre saw Marxism as the fundamental ground of intellectual life. Right. So if you are engaged in intellectual pursuits in a serious way, you have to contend with Marxism. And I think tonight we can talk a bit about Sartre's Marxism. I think that's one of the things we want to talk about. But, you know, I think we still live in that same world. You know, I think that that commitment, that total commitment to an intellectual understanding inspired by what Marx puts out, what Marx uh, challenges humanity to confront is still very much a calling that I think we we share that we that is our horizon. We we are still in that world, you know. So that's actually one of the things that I think Sartre is very correct about. There's many things in his analysis of Marxism that I would criticize. Maybe we can touch mm -hmm. a little bit on that tonight. But you know, that's a little bit about my own background is sort of um, kind of been studying most of my life. And now I'm at a place where I feel very independent. And um, I'm no longer really as concerned about things like credentialing and all of these kinds of things. I'm more interested in how that kind of Gramscian idea of the organic intellectual is a big interest to me, you know? So I'm how long have you been doing the emancipation podcast? Because I, I, every, uh, it seems like everything I pay attention to, there's eventually some sort of interview with you or some sort of episode, uh, that you're on. And I don't know if this is just the niches we both fall into that I wind up in contact with your work one way or, the, or another, but it's, yeah, even mutual acquaintances. It's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the the um, first of all, I mean, I think our world is um, is not too large. It's always important for us to grow and to engage beyond. But I think what we're doing in this collective effort matters a great deal because what I think a lot of what this activity is about of sort of streaming and engaging philosophy, engaging thought, engaging Marxist texts, etc engaging texts that we see as seminal, as somehow essential, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 bringing them into a conversation that would somehow be um, no longer rigidified in the way that they usually are rigidified or codified in academic milieus. So there's that intrinsic value of just like knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's also this possible, and I don't want to get too grandiose, but I think there's a possible political valence, possible political uh, subversive possibility that we're always trying to touch, right, in doing these kinds of activities. And um, that, I think, is born from the historical lessons that we have of how political movements have taken off in the past. Even, even I was reading today in Sartre's 
um, lectures on the roots of ethics in 1964, which he gave at the Gramsci Institute in Italy. Uh, he actually gave these lectures on the need for a morality in Marxism in 1964. And one of the things he said is that there are certain moments in the class struggle when education takes a priority, more so even than um, direct street agitation, you know, or direct uh, protest activity, right? And that's, I mean, obviously a question regarding consciousness and the um, activation of of the proletariat in in a kind of so. I, 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 to me, that's what this is about. Now, when I started my own podcast, I guess, my gosh, I don't even know now. It's been a few years. I changed the name recently, though. Um, okay. Because it, it was originally a kind of... Uh, tr okay. So if you want a, a real answer, it came out of the Trump period. And it started as an investigation inspired by... And <laughs> a reading group that we did on Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus. Okay. Of course, is a text that I've subsequently come to have like a great deal of criticism towards, <laughs> which we could talk about that if you want. But well, I do I, a little. I do want to talk about that a little along with your Nietzsche book. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. But it emerged out of a study group that we did there, and um, a friend of mine and uh, named Mike Crumpler. We gave the podcast originally the name of Jouissance Vampires, playing <laughs> off of uh, Jacques Lacan's uh, famous notion of jouissance, uh, which is a kind of enjoyment. So the enjoyment vampires. And uh, my partner, the co-host, was interested in um, incels. And I was interested in like Marxism. And so it was this like a Marxist and this kind of... Uh, but now, actually, Mike has gone on to become a literary reporter, kind of embedded in the New York Dime Square scene. And you should check out his thing. It's called Crump's Stack. It's a great sub stack. So that's actually where my podcast started. Then I kind of went independent because once the pandemic happened, I really started to basically reach out to all of these philosophers that I know. Because you see, I had the chance to study with Zizek and Bedju in Switzerland. And through that process of uh, doing their seminars, I got to know a lot of philosophers of a certain high caliber. Right. And uh, so I was able to sort of like reach out to them and say, would you give a lecture for free, you know, for the masses? And that's sort of where my channel started. And then I came up with the notion that I'm doing research on a given text, whether for a book or for a project or for an essay or for something that I'm doing. Why not just like kind of open it up? So then I started a Patreon, invited people to do study groups on psychoanalysis and politics is what I call it. So those are my two sort of public things, these study groups and these podcasts. And the podcasts are just interviews with authors and thinkers that I that I admire. That's really all it is. So do you feel like, I've, I'm going to ask you a question that I answer in the affirmative. Um, so do you feel like that taking up the authors that you do are like sort of the basic project uh, of looking at people like Lacan, uh, examining that in light of Marx, Zizek, do you think we're sort of repeating the Frankfurt School project on maybe a a higher tier or more, or maybe something more uh, contemporary, but still the same impulse? I think that a lot of what we do in this milieu owes itself to what the Frankfurt School first put down in terms of a research project. Mm -hmm. Although there's a lot of differences. I mean, I think to get more specific, I would even say that if you look out at a lot of the young Marxist public figures um, that do podcasting, that do streaming, or that are either academics or para-academics, or they just have, have a sort of foothold in 
thought and practice, let's say, nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, their formation was Zizekian. And I say that because Slavoj, I think for our generation, for our moment, emerges at a moment in which he becomes the paradigmatic figure of what it means to actually do scholarship that is enticing, that is of a radical uh, direction. Okay. And because he has a lineage, a direct uh, training formation himself, keep in mind he was trained by Lacan's number one student, Miller. Keep in mind that um, he comes, his, men, his other mentor is Ernesto Laclau. People forget that, but Ernesto Laclau was the most pivotal and important Althusserian Marxist uh, to emerge immediately following the collapse of the USSR, right? Okay. Zizek took over the mantle of Laclau in the media space following uh, his rise you know, in, the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And in that, in that period, if you are a millennial person, you are forming your political consciousness. And so he, he emerges as a site of a kind of identification for people. And so what I'm trying to say is that I think what's unique about our moment now is that a lot of people, while they are inspired by him, are certainly trying to transcend and push beyond what we perceive as many of his political limitations. And his political limitations, I think, are, are very much locatable in a very distinct geographical liberalism having to do with the Balkans, which is a liberalism which is very um, perniciously authoritarian and obedient to the status quo. And that's why Zizek has this paradoxical um, rebellious appearance while also supporting NATO also supporting Biden, things like that. That's a paradox in some sense. Um, you could also chalk up that to his Lacanian uh, proclivities towards the symbolic order, symbolic efficiency, authority, and so on. That's possible. But I would actually say it's mostly re reducible to that. So that's very different than our situation in, in the United States. It's a different political subjectivity. Yeah. Completely. And I don't think that Zizek actually knows. Uh, there's certain things about the subjectivity of a place that are very distinct and that you cannot simply, uh, there's like an embodiment factor that I think he lacks, that he doesn't have access to. So he's sort of like a master that we are all trying to overcome, right? Some of us are farther along in that process of overcoming him than others. But we should be honest that he is our inspiration, or he is a kind of model. So therefore, uh, the type of study that he approaches, the, the lineages of thought that he opens up for us, he gave us a bibliography, mm -hmm. right? So that's one, that's one thing. And then, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt School is is sort of a good example, although the Frankfurt School, I guess they're a good example in the sense that they were always marginal to the academy, very marginal, even though it's an irony because now the academy <laughs> and the authority of the academy does treat the Frankfurt School in a, reverent, a reverential relationship. It's oh, so yeah. very ironic, very ironic how that happens. You see my point, like take uh, an intellectual like CLR James, Mm -hmm. CLR James never got a job at an aca academic job his whole life. But after his death, he's treated as sacrosanct by academics. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, so it, absolutely. It, it's very, it, there's a lot of figures that are like that, actually, if you study the, the biograph biographies of intellectuals. It's very interesting. So I think, uh, you know, it's kind of like an outline of, a way I think we could get through a couple topics and arrive at the main thing we wanted to talk about. Um, I'd like to ask, you know, ask you about your book, uh, how to read like a parasite on Nietzsche. And I think maybe the through line will be sort of this discussion of irrationalism 
that sure. can bring us into two different topics. The the topic of your recent discussion with Haas, which is sort of what prompted me to reach out to you because you mentioned um, uh, um, the next topic. And um, then we could talk about Lukash, I think, and sure. like flesh out this uh, – this concept a bit more of irrationalism and how it, um, how it ties into the things you're criticizing in your book about Haas's mm-hmm. position or sort of like these, you know, this kind of, uh, Duganist sort of thing that's happening. And then also we could talk about Sartre in relation to that. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That sounds like an excellent plan. All right. So let's start with uh, how to read like a parasite. It's like, you know, it's not a small book, even though um, it might seem like it would be. And it's, uh, it's, so what what is the, (laughs) what is one of the basic uh, takes you're giving, I guess, on Nietzsche? Because there's a lot in here that you could talk about, I'm sure. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I suppose to connect it to irrationalism, uh, the first take is that Nietzsche perf- has a kind of political epistemology that, as an inventor of of great philosophical concepts, some of which are his originally, some of which are not his originally, but which he expands upon, like Rousantimant, for example. Um. There exists a kind of um, logic, a reading method, to get at the heart of unraveling uh, the function of the Nietzschean concepts. And um, that that heart is a a political core, what Domenico Lucerto calls totus politicus, right? That Nietzsche, and Nietzsche himself almost really confesses this in, in many instances, but it is it is also the case that Nietzsche's politics is very also aesthetic, right? So his his first text, Birth of Tragedy, is a text on music. Right. So but yet every aesthetic intervention also contains, right? Even in the concept of the Dionysian itself, there's always a latent politics that that resides. So so in a sense, the most consistent core of Nietzsche is a political core. And then we have to ask then, so what is this political core composed of? And um, the answer that that I offer, building off of the work of other Marxist critics of Nietzsche, of course, uh, is that is the fact that this political core is very unique. It's not just marginal, a kind of, oh, he just happens to be a reactionary liberal uh, like many others. And therefore, his politics are ordinary. And they therefore, because if they were ordinary, they could kind of be discarded. Right? Or if they were not militant, if they were not revolutionary, they could be discarded. Like if you say uh, Marx has no politics, it would make zero sense. Because right. we know that Marx actually argues that in the thesis on Feuerbach, right, that in fact, uh, philosophy itself uh, must be politicized insofar as this notion of what he calls praxis, right? This, this, um, this emphasis on action, um, seemingly over, over contemplation, right? So while in the same way that we would never extricate the political from Marx, we must never extricate it from Nietzsche. Why? Because Nietzsche himself also proposes himself as some type of revolutionary, in fact. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yet, there's an esoteric dimension to his revolutionary thought, which one has to follow. And here I follow Leo Strauss, the neoconservative philosopher, I follow Jeffrey Waite and other interpreters of Nietzsche to really show and reveal 
that the esoteric dimension of Nietzsche uh, revolves around a community building project, a kind of induction into, this is the, you know, project of Zarathustra, this is the project of the free spirits, this is the notion of the Ubermensch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so what ultimately is at stake is the construction of a kind of alternate, alternative political community to the predominant socialistic uh, movements of Nietzsche's time. And so uh, my book is a, an examination of how Nietzsche concocts a community that is meant to suppress socialistic movements primarily, although not exclusively. Other movements of the left, all movements of the left must be suppressed. But what's unique about Nietzsche's radicalism is that he's not um, prophesying or sort of calling forth a nostalgic return to an antiquated form of traditional community. No, he's concocting a radical aristocracy of the future. And he's exert he's he's calling for a new type of religiosity as well. It's something that people often miss in Nietzsche, which is that uh, Nietzsche does have a way through the notion of transvaluation of values to speak about a new morality, to speak about um, the cre a, a, a radical creation. Right? So Nietzsche has this radical affirmative core in his communi community building project, which itself... Uh, itself serves certain interests that are very much in line with existing power. That's the key point. And so my argument is that the left has performed a kind of historical uh, ignorance and refusal to see these, this operation that I've just outlined, right? And has in some cases internalized Nietzsche uncritically. And that when the left has internalize Nietzsche uncritically and depoliticize Nietzsche, certain effects occur in the philosophical compass of the left. The philosophical compass of the left gets misdirected. Okay? Now, my position, of course, has sparked a profound backlash <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But why? We have to ask why, right? Right. And uh, I mean, I'd love for your thoughts on that, but I have my own thoughts uh, regarding that. And it requires a certain um, humility to, I mean, first of all, it's interesting to write a controversial book. Um, I don't really have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that because I believe in the, you know, I have I have a kind of fidelity to the argument, right? And um, And I knew that writing the book, that it would produce a strong response because I perform something that Nietzsche performs in the book, which a lot of postmodern leftist Nietzscheans don't do, which is that I bring autobiography into the story. And of course, we know that Nietzsche started Ecce Homo when he was a young man. So his, his, his philosophy is always infused with an autobiographical tinge, right? And that's, I think, actually a positive. The, the other thing that's a, and uh, it should be obvious, but I'll just say it for listeners: uh, this is not an anti-Nietzschean book. It's a, mm. it's a different than that. I find anti-Nietzscheanism actually quite vulgar because that's actually represents a refusal to learn from him. It's a, it's a book that's trying to re-pivot and reposition a reading and engagement with Nietzsche as a hostile force on the left. Because the French Nietzscheans out of 68 in particular, but other milieus as well, never pose Nietzsche as hostile. They, so, they, they em embrace Nietzsche as a trustworthy ally. I, I propose that we reverse that. And I think that's the heart of a lot of deep frustration with, with my proposal. So I was going to ask you how much of what you mentioned earlier about Deleuze and Guattari and having uh, criticisms of their project is related to what you're um, talking about here with Nietzsche and the uh, 
like what you just said, this embrace of Nietzsche on the left in France that did not mm-hmm. uh, put him into uh, the critical light that I think you're saying he deserves to be read in. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, there's a great new book right now by Mehdi Belhaj Kassem, who's uh, one of great protege of Alain Badiou, the living contemporary French philosopher. And I'm not, um, I mean, one, one thing that should be noted is that I am a Marxist thinker. It's kind of existing outside the university, one foot in, one foot out. I'm not an academic specialist on like um, German scholarship or French scholarship. No, I have particular Marxist uh, objectives. So it's been interesting that even though Nietzsche, who, as you know, as you probably know, is a great critic of academic authority. One of the ironies that has emerged after the Second World War is that all of his followers tend to be use the authority of the university as their linchpin when they defend him, right? So usually when you have a Nietzschean assault uh, or when you have a Nietzschean critique, right, it, it falls on the authority of the academy, which I find to be ironic. And I don't think it's actually in the spirit of Nietzsche himself. Because I think the spirit of Nietzsche himself was actually a profound critic of the of the university. In fact, um, that's another matter. Well, what Kassem says is that we can understand the depoliticized, the defanging of Nietzsche's true radicalism at the site of the wound of the four year or maybe five year, I forget how long exactly, occupation that the Nazis, the Germans had over France. Precisely because the generation that grew up in the wake of that wound, right, came to, um, Kassem says that George Bataille is one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, but when it comes to Nietzsche, he stops thinking, right? This is one reason, okay? Another reason has to do with uh, the translation process itself. Because you see, there was these two Italian figures, Montanari and Coli, who were in East Germany, where Nietzsche's archive existed after the war, and it was actually supervised by the Soviets. And the Soviets... uh, because Nietzsche was so deeply bound up with the ideological and intellectual project of Hitlerism and the Nazis, putting aside whether that's valid or not, let's just say it's a fact. Uh, You see, the Soviets were very careful about what they allowed for. So there emerges a repressed, depoliticized translation of Nietzsche that we have been introduced to, as a result of this repression and uh, uneasy and uncomfortable censorship that existed around the release of all of Nietzsche's material. Because the release of even Walter Kaufman wasn't dealing Uh, with all of, he wasn't dealing with all of Nietzsche, right? We only really get all of Nietzsche, I think in like, like the late 1970s, okay? So, those are some of the dynamics in a practical sense. Now we can talk philosophically about how they perform these very wild interpretations of Nietzschean concepts, how they reinvent Nietzschean concepts. The problem that I have with their reinvention of Nietzschean concepts is that we lose out uh, on the on what we could gain. We could gain a kind of great adversary, a great adversary who knew socialism very well who knew our struggle very well, right? Um, But instead, they depoliticize him, and what you you get is a kind of um, free-floating postmodern thinker who uh, concocts these kind of, uh, I don't know, like these kind of, uh, they kind of, like, I could share several examples of how Derrida does this, how Deleuze does this, how Foucault does this, I'm not saying that what they do with Nietzsche is not interesting. I'm just saying that it's not good for politics. So I'm not, I'm not saying like, stop reading Deleuze's Nietzsche, which is a text that Cornel West said is the origin of postmodernism. 
right? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying read it with some new lens, which you haven't had available to you. Because I would actually argue, Jared, that most people haven't been introduced to this political Nietzsche that, I've in, that I'm trying to bring out. And part of the reason they haven't is because one of the texts, there's two texts that are the foundation of my book. The Destruction of Reason by George Lukács, the great Hungarian Marxist philosopher, who I think is the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, where he develops a kind of a thorough, wide-ranging political interpretation of Nietzsche's thought, including his metaphysics. So this is a philosophical analysis of Nietzsche's politics, how it is infused philosophically. And then there is a great political biography that is very, very thorough by an Italian Marxist historian by the name of Domenico Lacerdo. And that's called Aristocratic Rebel. Okay. So those two texts give us the kind of pinnacle for this new way of seizing a new picture of Nietzsche. That's the foundation of my of my book. When did that Lukash text get uh, translated to English? That it got translated, word... I think, in the eighties. Okay, eighties, but um, it had been brandished before that by Adorno as a Stalinist, a Stalinist quote unquote Stalinist text. And one of the things that I've had the really the honor to be a part of with historical materialism journal is because you see a new release has of the text has come out in English in 2022. I'm now a co-editor of a new series of essays by Lukács scholars with historical materialism that shows, and we kind of disprove that the text is a Stalinist text, by the way. So I'm excited to sort of bring that out into the world because the consequences of that are, could be significant. Because you see, in the West, if you uh, accuse a Marxist text of being Stalinist, you accuse it of anti-intellectual, you, 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 you shut it out, right? Mm -hmm. So the argument is not to shut this text out, not to shut it out at all. So... Um. Yeah, I think we're going to see uh, some similarity between Sartre and Lukács and the way both of them have been received. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there are people who have tried to do this with Sartre and brand him as a Stalinist, even though we know from his activity in France that he was very much not in favor of post-1956 Stalin. Um. And to the point to where, you know, there's a whole book about uh, uh, Sartre's relationship to Stalin, just mm -hmm. to Stalinism, just to try to deal with that. And I think there's a lot of similarities within that that are going to be interesting to explore. Um, but uh, yeah, on Nietzsche in particular, I think you asked me why I'm not surprised it's, that your book on him is receiving yeah. a backlash. And I don't think I've really developed this, you know, uh, formally, but just intuitively, Nietzsche seems to be everyone's baby. Everyone has their own Nietzsche and you're attacking the baby in some way that's not easy to dismiss. So <laughs> uh, it's going to generate, you know, a lot of feelings is, is where I'm at with that, uh, that intuition. But um, personally, I think that's valid. I'm, I'm, I have not uh, returned to study Nietzsche since I began becoming interested in philosophy with Walter Kaufman's books. And, you know, when that was kind of the only standard reading you'd get at a, a bookstore and his translations and uh, introductions to Nietzsche's work. So I... My, I have read a little bit about his relationship with anti-Semitism, mm. which for obvious reasons, I have a personal uh, interest in understanding. And I came out of one book in particular about that feeling 
like Nietzsche is fairly conservative and that his anti anti Semitism is not necessarily pro <laughs> philo Semitic in some very important ways, but that's mm. another topic. Um, well, yeah. One thing that's important to mention there is that the Domenico Lucerto text I mentioned a moment ago called Aristocratic Rebel has an appendix to it, which examines the long, long standing claim on behalf of the Nietzschean scholarly community that Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche is responsible for um, intensifying or accentuating uh, 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 anti Semitism, which does not exist in Nietzsche. Right. Okay. Lucerto actually shows, if anything, the opposite is true. Because um, you have to read the section to see my, what I mean. He shows in careful detail. He, he develops a very concrete case. So much so that Robert Holub, who recently passed away, who's the preeminent scholar on Nietzsche and Judaism, praises Lucerto in a forthcoming review for revealing this for the first time. Okay. And is this in your book or are you talking about in Lacerdo's book? I'm talking about in Lacerdo's book. Okay. Okay. So this is significant because you see the Nietzschean scholars, okay, left Nietzscheans. Remember, remember, left Nietzscheans are a paradoxical group because they rely on the, the authority of the academy. But when the authority of the academy cannot serve their agenda, cannot serve their sort of assumptions, they kind of have nowhere to run. And this is a the biggest, one of the biggest, there's many others, but one of the biggest consequences of Lucerto's intervention, which is that he abolishes the Elizabeth myth, apropos anti-Semitism. So that, if that's true, because you see, that was one of the main sites where the love affair of Nietzsche as a non-contradictory figure or as a redeeming figure could survive. Mm -hmm. But when you remove that, it becomes more difficult. So, uh, this is this is this is this is a significant thing, and you'll see Holub's review. And I, I encourage everyone to read uh, Lacerdo's very convincing case on that on that issue. And I also did an interview with Jan Raymond um, on this precise issue on my show. You can check that out as well. Yeah, I'll definitely get some links in the uh, description and have them in there to both of those things. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, at least, you know, as far as me and Nietzsche goes, that's sort of the end of the line where I've been with it. I was interested in your book because of specifically because that's where I left off with him. And nice. I also saw, you know, Matt McManus or, you know, there's, you know, this, another attempt to get Nietzsche into the imaginary of the left again, at least in the part of the left I pay attention to. Right. And you know, my, uh, my visceral response is like, I don't want to deal with that happening. So I sort of took interest in your book. I was like, Oh good. No, people aren't just going to, you know, let that slide. Um, well, I mean, again, not this that is you're attacking his book or anything, but no, 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 no. I mean, look, I think the, there's a real question here because on the one hand, we have a resurgent right-wing Nietzscheanism that's happening right. from Bronze Age pervert to Richard Hanina to, I mean, even Sorab Amari recently wrote about the the dime store right-wing Nietzscheans on the, on. and now what's unique about these cats is that they are all associated with liberalism, okay? So it's a kind of, which is interesting because if you study Nietzsche's own relationship to the politics of liberalism, he actually, in many cases, has a kind of implicit solidarity with liberalism himself, even though he professes an aristocratic radical agenda. Because you see the key point for Nietzsche, in Nietzsche's politics is ult ultra stabilization of social order so that... Uh, great art and aesthetics can blossom. So you see, it's never wise to treat Nietzsche in full cancellation mode, like get him out of here. 
because there's always a grain, a kind of kernel of something noble in Nietzsche, something that he mm-hmm. teaches you. Okay. But it's, it's always at the same time, what I call a Janus face. You know, it's a Janus face in which there's this agenda that's attached to it that you have to be aware of. And so I literally do believe that people have been reading this thinker with kind of half lens, with like kind of one eye covered, in my view, okay? So what does it mean to read him with both eyes? Well, it doesn't mean that that he must be abandoned. No, it means that actually he becomes a kind of pugilistic force, actually. And mm-hmm. you sort of you sort of get like a high off of him in a different way. Um, it's very different than even, even Heidegger because Heidegger's right wing commitments are super concealed in reality. Like so much so that Marcuse, his student, Herbert Marcuse says that after he did his dissertation with Heidegger, he couldn't, and before the Nazis came to power. Okay. He said he couldn't even see Heidegger as right wing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Nietzsche is not really the same way, right? Because Nietzsche is about building something, building this community. He's about creating these myths. He's, he's always taking on politics. He's always taking on political figures. He's very polemical, you know, he's very singular political thinker. So you mentioned Heidegger um, I know you just did an episode on Heidegger on the left that I haven't had the chance to watch yet, but I'm pretty interested in seeing that too. Do you, and, you know, ultimately I want to get to this point of where we're getting to Lukash. Yeah. And, uh, because I took a look at the table of contents for the, for the work you mentioned and it, I feel like it's uh global, its scope is so global in what it's covering. Destruction of um, reason. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That um, it would it would really be a commitment to try to get through any of it before we did this uh, interview. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'm I'm kind of trying to figure out like are we are we putting Nietzsche, Heidegger, Deleuze, some of these other figures under into the same like criticism that Lukash would have. Or are the you know are we treating them as somewhat discrete uh, thinkers that don't share that much commonality? Well, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, we should take a step back and understand Lukács' critique of phenomenology yeah. writ large. I think that's important because one of the things that he argues that Husserl uh, an error in Husserl's conception of this notion of the intentionality of the subject is that he thinks that, and he thinks the same with Heidegger as well, that this is born from social conditions of imperialism. So the first thing to understand about Lukács is that he, and I think this is a correct premonition on his part, he believes that philosophers are the product of a class worldview. And the social being of a philosopher is marked by the class experience, okay? Hmm. Now, when imperialism takes place, certain um, abandonment occurs around commitments to enlightenment-oriented objectives in philosophy, universalism, consciousness, and the notion that Hegel put forward, which is that philosophy must concern itself with social being. I must always be tethered to social being. And so therefore that tradition of rationalism, which Hegel picks up and modifies in his own way through the dialectical method and so on, Lukács provides a genealogy of how European philosophy abandons this calling. Because for Lukács, and kind of like for Marx as well, Hegel kind of completes the system of German idealism and therefore brings philosophy into an imminent social realization. 
Lukács says that Hegel gave philosophy a social purpose. Okay. In times of imperialism, philosophy flees from a conception of ontology, of reflections on being that would be determined by the social field and by social sociality. And so therefore you could say in a certain way, and you see this in Heidegger as well, philosophy becomes a reflection of the despair that imperialism is imbuing within bourgeois worldview. So that's the first important point that I think is a lesson we should always keep in mind, which is that philosophy is an expression of the Weltanschauung of a class worldview. Now in capitalist society, the class worldview of philosophy is, is the bourgeoisie, right? Right. And I think that this is actually something that Sartre knew quite well. And we can talk about Sartre's theories of social being and class being, because it's something that Lukács and Sartre share, although they have differences in many important ways, they both affirm I think in different ways that intellectuals are formed in this way. So that's the first point I want to make in this regard. Um, I think the other point that I would want to make here is that um, vitalism, like Bergson, um, kind of the way that philosophers incorporate Darwin and Darwinian truths, um, is a lineage that Lukács will exert a fundamental criticism towards. And he'll chalk vitalist philosophies, you know, philosophies of life, philosophies that um, kind of invert materialism away from its social foundation. That's the key point. And they kind of implant the origin of philosophy in the kind of organism or in a kind of um, mystical conception of life, right? As this kind of excessive form of life and uh, imbue a conception of life that uh, almost, almost gives birth to a form of epistemology, a form of knowledge of reality that Lukács calls aristocratic epistemology. So vitalism leads to what he calls aristocratic epistemology. What is that? Well, it really starts in his view with Schelling, but it's kind of the idea that intuition as the organon of philosophy becomes privileged. And when intuition becomes privileged, this is something that a lot of vitalists do, but not all of them, it becomes a problem for Lukács as a kind of Marxist Hegelian in the sense that um, often you get ultimately a quite exclusive conception of how truth can be known and how truth can be accessed by others. And so what you get is a kind of what he calls a supra-rationalism emerge, right? In which basically truth is kind of reducible to um, a rare crust of philosophers have access. So intuitionism mm -hmm. produces this exclusive conception. Now, if in the Hegelian idea, even though, even though Hegel was a liberal, almost quasi, uh, you know, quasi monarchist at times, you know, in support in the philosophy of right for a conception of a liberal social order that people could criticize as conservative, right? Even though that's true, Hegel also puts forward in the phenomenology of spirit, a fundamentally egalitarian conception of the absolute as an imminent social realization. And Marx continues this. So there's something undeniably egalitarian about the vocation of Hegelian philosophy. What imperialism does is it creates social conditions that reify the rigidity of the social order. And that then becomes reflected in the philosophers and the ideas that they produce. And that becomes um, hierarchical. It becomes a cele a, 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 they He says that a lot of philosophers in imperialism produce theories of nature 
this is very uh, evident in Nietzsche, in which nature is understood as a blind reflection of the brutal and cruel conditions that imperialism itself and colonialism have produced. So again, the predominant motif is this retreat from all focus on the social and the consequences of that. Now that's where phenomenology emerges for Lukács, okay? And that's where it sprouts. And he argues that it becomes a kind of, uh, a very naive form of idealism ultimately, and a pessimistic idealism at that, because it cannot think consciousness at the level of being. So it, 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 therefore, it therefore abandons the fundamental Marxist proposal, which we know in Theses on Feuerbach is this notion of the determination of social being and its relation to consciousness. A social being is primary, right? Not consciousness, mm -hmm. right? You see my point? So for them, it's like, in some cases, and this is where he argues that Sartre, even though it's important to say when Lukács critiques Sartre, he doesn't critique the critique of dialectical reason. That would right. be much interesting because he doesn't critique the Marxist Sartre. Right. He critiques the pre-Marxist Sartre. It would be fascinating if he were to, I mean, I, I could already envision, there's actually not much written about Sartre and Lukács, there should be more. Right, yeah. You know? So these are some basic lines. We can dig in more, in more detail. I'm just trying to give you a kind of overlay, you know? Hopefully that's a little helpful. Sure, yeah. One thing that stuck out to me in the, uh, the criticism that Lukács makes about existentialism yeah, um, is the suspicion of a third way that comes... Uh, between idealism and materialism. And I think you somewhat explained what he's getting at when you uh, emphasize that the social character of uh, philosophy or, or uh, ontology gets lost uh, right. in this like imperial mode of doing philosophy. Right. Um, is that, so is that, ultimately what the suspicion is, or is there some deeper reason why idealism and materialism are fundamentally the two choices that are available? Yeah, I think that Lukács' fundamental position, by the way, in the notion of, because some Marxists have critiqued his privileging of irrationalism as itself, they've wanted to question, uh, are you using this category of irrationalism as a kind of new uh, primary method that somehow usurps or replaces dialectical materialism? <laughs> and I think the answer is uh, that's that's a poor reading of Lukács' notion of irrationalism because let's define that because I think once we define that, we can get at your question a little bit more precisely. Sure. Let me very briefly define irrationalism for Lukács. Irrationalism is a tendency in European philosophy after Immanuel Kant's Copernican Revolution, where in general, Kant puts forward this notion that man has a relationship to the totality, but ultimately the totality is kind of unknowable. And this is right. the famous notion of the noumenal. And so Kant, in a certain sense, and many Marxists, including one of Lukács' close kind of friends, Lucien Goldman, wrote a very important book on Kant. It's just called Immanuel Kant by, by Lucien Goldman. Or he shows that actually, yeah, Hegel is the true heir to Marx in a technical sense. But the original kind of impulse of what makes all of this idea of the Marxist horizon possible is Kant. And in that that's the case because Kant puts forward a conception of community, right? That is about the kind of universal achievement of, of, uh, of a universalism, which had never before been actually 
laid down and the principles codified in philosophy in a formalized way until Kant. But Kant, Goldman says, was proposing a tragic vision in which ultimately this universalism cannot be fully enacted, cannot be fully realized. It would then take Hegel and then Marx. So it's an interesting way because Lukács and, Go and Goldman kind of show you that it goes Kant, Hegel, Marx. It's not just Hegel, Marx. That's, I think, a very important thing to keep in mind as a side point. But what Kant put forward in this noumenal notion, this unknowability notion, has, uh, according to Lukács, been the birth of irrationalism. And this is what we find in what's called neo-Kantianism, right? There's kind of two predominant schools of neo-Kantianism. We don't need to get into all of the details of them, but what they basically put forward is this kind of conception that history and this kind of, because you see one of the things of the Kantian notion of uh, cosmopolitan universalism and of his Kant's political writings and so on is the idea that there's a kind of resolution of man's relationship to history, right? So Kant kind of inaugurates in a certain way this notion of historicity, which we see all throughout from Kant all the way up to Heidegger and beyond. This notion that part of what the realized community, what Hegel calls the system of ethical life, is about is the kind of reconciliation of man's his de destiny and history. Okay. But in the neo-Kantian vision, that horizon is not fully achievable. So therefore, Lukács says that they create a kind of irrationalism around the knowledge or the achievement of history itself. So the historical process of a community coming into a higher version of itself, realizing itself at a higher level, is kind of blocked for the neo-Kantians, right? It's a kind of it's a kind of latent pessimism in a certain way. Now, the funny thing is for Lukács, those were like um, Rickert and some of these other neo-Kantians were actually uh, Lukács' teachers. So part of what he's trying to say is that they birthed this um, irrationalism. And irrationalism basically is this, uh, yeah, it's, it's this way that philosophers incorporate the noumenal incorporate the, the unknowability of reality. And one of the big things is exactly that, which is irrationalism affirms that reality is ultimately unknowable. So the resolution between the subject and the object, the subject-object division itself is unknowable. It's not, it's, mm -hmm. There's no resolution possible. That is what Lukács would call irrationalism. Lukács wants to affirm that that dialectical resolution is indeed historically realizable. That's the grand Hegelian project. This is what Lukács means in history and class consciousness of this, uh, of this process for how he's trying to think how that subject object dialectic could function in a concrete political situation of the working class. So that's kind of like a very condensed definition of irrationalism, but it's about this unknowability of social reality on the one hand. It has other forms. Uh, aristocratic epistemology is one effect of it. Vitalism is another effect of it. Um, but that's the basic idea. It's, uh, one, one, thing, one important thing is to say is that we should be careful how we apply it. Because if you take like phenomenology... It's not fair to just say all of phenomenology is irrationalist. That right. would be too strong. That would be too strong. There are elements that go very far that Lukács will qualify as irrationalist. There's also tendencies to criticize Lukács because he's not perfect here. I'll give you an example where he goes too far. He will say things like, literary forms like James Joyce have no pertinence because they are of a kind of pure irrationalism or a pure vitalism or a pure expressivism. And therefore they, they don't 
provide a social form that would provide a kind of adequate um, contestation to capitalist social forms. Because that's ultimately what Lukács is kind of interested in. And he thinks that irrationalist philosophies generally are a reflection of bourgeois philosophy. And you see another thing that he says, by the way, I'll, I'll end here. He agrees with Frederick Engels that Marxism, and this I think is a great co consequence, okay, of Lukács, which is that Marxism must create its own philosophy that is an expression of the worldview of the proletariat. So if bourgeois philosophy is an expression of the class being of the proletariat, a question to ask would be, what would the construction of a philosophy that is of the working class and the proletariat consist in? That's an interesting question. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And But I think that's actually one of the things Lukács wants to ask. I don't think that he answers that, but I think that's one thing he wants to ask. Right? So when you, when I hear you describe irrationalism in this way, I, my brain keeps coming back to this is sort of like irrational numbers that repeat uh, without pattern into infinity and they can't be contained. That there's something about this uh, sort of telos or projection into the future of like a permanent bourgeois existence as opposed to like something universal that is i maybe i'm not following it the no way i mean that, I, think, I, I think i think the the tethering point to understand it is that it's a hegelian theory about how philosophy wavers from the social purpose and social vocation social orientation social grounding <laughs> in an analysis of social forms in society in an analysis of the reality of capitalism, right? One of the big things that Lukács critiques in Sartre, in the early Sartre, being in nothingness, is that he has no account of fetishism. What's your theory of fetishism, right? Fetishism is not something that the phenomenologists have an adequate theory of, right? Fetishism can only be understood as a social relation, as Marxist materialism, right? That's an example of how irrationalist philosophies will miss a necessary conception of reification, of the condition that consciousness is subordinated to in capitalism. And irrationalist philosophy kind of misses the operation of capitalist social life. That's the problem with it. And in so doing, it therefore naturalizes capitalist social relations and creates a philosophy off of their naturalization. That's a big, big motif in Nietzscheanism. Nietzscheanism takes the brutality of the imperialist colonial period in European social life and tries to render it as almost eternal. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You see, now, now I think we're getting closer. It's this missing of the uh, structural systemic basis of the operations of capitalist society and creating a philosophy also from the premise of the Kantian noumenal because the Kantian noumenal almost w grants permission to the philosopher to avoid whole domains of social knowledge in reality. Lukács says this about Husserl and phenomenology, that they avoid domains of, of social reality. Right? So that, that's a big part of it. It's it's also an avoidance, I think. So I definitely can see how that applies to being in nothingness as well. Because one of the central things Sartre is doing in that book is posing the problem between being and knowledge. And, uh, and in this sense, there is a noumenal kind of quality to being that makes it so that knowledge is always lagging behind in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which, uh, it seems like he does carry that into future work as well. I, I, but I, so there's this new left review 
translation of Sartre's lecture in Rome, which yeah. was a, a couple of years before the other text we mentioned at the Gram, Gramsci Institute. And it's very clearly a, resp- a response to Lukash. Uh, oh, he, yeah. I mean, he, he even gives one section title uh, against Lukács as the title. There's that, and he, you know, emphasizes fetishism and reification, and you know that critique definitely got to him. Uh, you know, we're talking it twenty years later, but right, yeah. I'm I'm not an expert on um on like French society and French history, but I do know this: when history and class consciousness was translated and brought into the French intellectual world of the left. Uh, I believe it was, it was as early as the 1930s. Okay, so soon after its early publication in like 23, 24. Uh, and apparently it made a massive, a massive splash. In fact, we have a lecture that we have just translated with historical materialism by Henri Lefebvre uh, on, on this. On Another Le- big influence on later Sartre as well. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that Lukács threw a monkey wrench into French philosophy with history and class consciousness, right? And I do think after having read the lecture Marxism and Subjectivity that you just mentioned, I do think that Sartre kind of reveals himself as a poor reader of Lukács, in fact, as does the other way around, as does Lukács onto Sartre. So it's what I call a two ships passing in the night. Yeah, They don't read each other that well, unfortunately. Um, before okay. we get a little more abstract, can you kind of go over the way that people responded to Lukács, especially like other Marxists? Because what I keep seeing is that, you know, there's an initial embrace with history and class consciousness. And then a distancing as Lukash started putting out later works. That's correct. Yeah. There's, there was a, Lukash wrote this text, history and class consciousness from the position of a kind of outlaw communist entity within the, uh, the wider Leninist situation. Um, and, after 1917, after 1917, Lukács has a grand kind of scene, you know, m- m- the road to Damascus moment, if you know the reference, uh, and he becomes a Bolshevik, uh, and he writes this kind of speculative text called History and Class Consciousness, where he introduces uh, concepts that he would become known by, uh, such as reification, which is a term that is kind of like commodity fetishism that we know from capital. And of course, Marx uses the word reification in capital, but Lukács is seen as sort of giving it a fuller scope and a fuller philosophical foothold. In that regard, it's undeniable his contributions to pure Marxist understanding of capitalist social life. And everyone will praise him at that level. So the text, therefore, becomes polemical. I'll get to why it's polemical in a moment, but it becomes a true contribution, okay? That everybody can kind of recognize as a true contribution on the Marxist front, okay? Um, But I think a lot of Stalinists will argue that it is an ultra-leftist text because what he's proposing within it is a sort of uh, vanguard position of the proletariat. And there's a certain radicalism that he's proposing of how the vanguard can impute consciousness for the working working class to undergo a kind of, um, like, in a sense, you could walk away from reading history and class consciousness and say that the puzzle has been completed for answering the question of, of revolutionary Leninism itself, which is how is the working class to be activated in a political sequence 
for its achievement as a sort of realized political agency, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, this thing I mentioned before, the neo-Kantian problem of the class in itself and class for itself dialectic, Lukács, suffice it to say, gives us a full answer to this achievement. And the full answer is afforded by the Leninist vanguard cadre of intellectuals imputing consciousness at certain moments in the class struggle in which the class's collective interest becomes realized. So it's a careful essay, series of essays about this process of, of an achieved, uh, it's, a, it's almost like a manual for any Marxist to think about what the philosophical consequences are for a successful revolution. Does that make sense? That's what yes. you could define history and class consciousness as. Now, 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 uh, people critique it from a number of registers. You have to understand that Lukács himself critiques it heavily in the early 1960s, and he critiques it because he's experiencing a world after the disillusion of Stalinism, after the Hungarian Revolution, after a bunch of events had occurred, which looked very different than the early 1920s. And in this world, this clean transmission of the knowledge of the imputed consciousness of the vanguard down to the working class or over to the working class, things don't work this way anymore. Capitalism in the post-war situation has changed. We now have what they call state capitalism. There's new class formations. The working class is no longer tethered in its relationship to the factory as it was before. So therefore he revises. He tries to revise a lot of things. And he, what he does is he goes back to the early Marx. And uh, there's a lot of work that he does about trying to understand Marx's own relationship. Because what, what, he, what he realizes then and then later is that Everything in Marxism is about the proletariat's relationship to the standpoint of the totality. And that the most decisive act of Marxism, what lights the fire of the revolutionary sequence is the, and the re therefore the resolution of the subject-object dualism, is the capacity for the working class to develop a collective standpoint of its own self-interests yeah. on the one hand, but that then becomes only a second, uh, uh, an initial movement for which you then need a vanguard to elaborate that to another level. So that becomes dialectical in that way, but it's about the standpoint. And now he develops and refines this notion of standpoint by reading Marx's careful, Marx and Engels is careful, political activity from 1848 up through the Paris Commune. That's a very interesting contribution of Lukács, which is that Lukács' history and class consciousness achieves two things. It has this wonderful exposition of the marks of capital through reification, as I mentioned before. If you read it, you'll get a clear sense of that. But on the other hand, it has a wonderful exposition of the political marks, of like Marx at the level of like a political actor, as a strategist. So he achieves both things. That's why the text is so essential. Hmm. Okay, now, when, I, when you ask me about the critiques of it, I must say, like most critiques, Jared, most critiques are pretty bad faith. Like we reading Sar we're reading Sartre's critique of Lukács. Maybe <laughs> it's not bad faith, but it's not, a, it's not good, it's not thorough. Okay. So when you say, what are the critiques? I mean, they're, they're cliches, you know, they're kind of, I would say often exaggerated critiques, you know, they're overshadowed by shallow political agendas. You know, it's the same thing when they say that, uh, whenever somebody gives you one reason to reject a book, like it was Adorno who said, uh, we must reject destruction of reason. Only in a few pages did he say this. It was a very 
it was a very poor form on Adorno's part to do that. But that's how intellectuals sometimes spar with each other. In well, a this very is what happened way. at Eric Fromm as well at Adorno. Oh, really? Yeah, Adorno dismissed him as a as a um, a mere uh, popularizer, and uh, that was yeah. the the image that became popular of uh, you know the the quality of who he was. <laughs> yeah, this is why I feel you know Elaine Badiou, one of my mentors, he made an interesting pivot in his life that I really admire, which is that. Uh, he stopped. He stopped making polemical refutations of an, an exaggerated modality. He used to do that. Famously, you know, he would literally like go into another professor's classroom and like um, put his body on the line and protest them. <laughs> but now, like, you know, all of and that was like in the 60s, you know. But okay. all of his enemies, so-called, in the 60s, by the time of, say, like, you know, like the 90s till now, he has a different kind of more, he'll still have a polemic, but it's much more measured, and it's not so bombastic. However, he'll still be bombastic to, like, figures that are, say, reactionaries or sort of. But you see, that's the point is, like, that kind of goes back to my debate with Haas. People ask me, why did I debate Haas? Partially, it was due to the fact that Haas sees himself as a Marxist, and he sees himself as putting forward a Marxist program that is always evolving. So I had a bunch of people that study Haas's work, and I they encouraged me to do it because I know a lot about Marxism, and I could make an intervention that would shift his thinking. So if I became a figure for Haas, who he respected, I could then counsel him to not be transphobic, to not be anti-homo-gay uh, people, to not be X, Y, Z. Because the truth is, is Haas isn't going to go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So why not try a new strategy that would get on the inside to shift him? And th so far, like, you know, I can do that. So I think that my my strategy was sort of so far successful. It was an experiment. You know, I came under criticism for doing it. But at the same time, I spoke, I spoke my truth. I offered my critique of him, you know. Um, and so we'll see where it goes. But you know, that's the effect. The effect has been to um, say, look, I don't think you're a fascist. I think you're a Marxist who has some troubled ideas, you need to iron these out. You need to move this. You need to, you know what I'm saying? Now, the the thing is, is that I'm not responsible, therefore, for Haas. So if Haas makes a mistake, it's not a reflection on me. I'm not a mentor to him. Right. But, but uh, I'm willing to insert myself and clarify things and point things out that I think are wrong because he has inserted himself as a Marxist. Okay? And I think as a fellow Marxist, we need to debate one another. Just in the same way that I would debate uh, a liberal or I would debate you know, people of ideological differences. I would not debate people who are of like a true fascist uh, var variant. But again, I don't think that Haas elevates to a question of a fascist position. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, 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 I get pretty uh, disappointed in – you know, um, these attitudes of not engaging, you know, I, I, I'm not a Marxist yet. I interview a lot of Marxists, you know, I, I engage with a lot of Marxists. I'm an anarchist, but right. Right. Uh, I don't see any benefit in, uh, retreating to a silo and merely, uh, building up, you know, some sort of, uh, school, that could maybe uh, present itself as some sort of force, you know, acting on its own. I think this, I've experienced yeah. this in, uh, you know, my own past working in very siloed uh, post left anarchist. Uh, okay. Uh, milieus. And sure. um, 
I've always had a very uh, strong critique of it that, you know, for whatever the disagreement is, engagement is the only, you know, real way to do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, the problem I think we have is that, like, so much political crises and anxieties could be alleviated through the development of proletarian institutions, such as the party, but even cultural institutions, that would function as a kind of bellwether against this marketized entrepreneurial individualism. Because in the market, right, we are all like reptilian-brained competitive agents against one another. Mm -hmm. And if we signal solidarity with somebody, um, that signals some kind of uh, sort of vague in-group, out-group rivalry. Because then their enemies become your enemies. This kind of idea is something I'm opposed to. I think that a the development of institutions would help alleviate this hyper individualism. So yes. I don't really see things. I don't see things that way. My enemies um, are not like you can agree with my Nietzsche book, but not have the same enemies as me. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's this mindset that emerges out of censorship, out of this kind of uh, theory of no platforming. And I think the no platforming theory needs to be questioned. I understand its logic for uh, combating um, the far right, you know. But when it gets so easily applied, you know, there's this group called Midwestern Marx. Midwestern Marx is supported by the Monthly Review. Monthly Review is one of the most prestigious Marxist journals. Simultaneous to that, you have young liberal academics on Twitter who think that Midwestern Marx is fascist. They're not. You know what I mean? So there's this uh, insanity that kind of goes on in the market. It's all driven by this market hyperactive thing. So, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how conscious it is either. And um, something I like to think about and study a lot is you know the way that marketing strategies are targeting the less conscious aspects of who we are maybe the subconscious or unconscious well that's true i mean that's true there's been studies about you know even state intervention and intelligence agencies i don't like to i think when you entertain that presupposition that you then become paranoid and creates a kind of paranoid <laughs> politics, you know? And I, I don't really yeah. think that that, that, that shuts thinking down that prevents that, that not only does that prevent conversations, it prevents mutual <laughs> interdependence. I get it's, it. It does a lot of damage. So I see your I point. Even, How does, so do you, when you say that, you know, the market, um, is having this consequence are, you know, how are you thinking about that? You know, from the, uh, you know, is that a consequence that's consciously being carried out by the people who are creating these factions and competitive, uh, group hustles and things like that? Or is, I, I think that's more what I'm saying here. Is it something a little more uh, in the water? It's something that only the generation of institutions that are constructed with a intentional uh, inbuilt uh, set of procedures to protect people from the degradations of the market can solve. Otherwise, you will have, say, for example, the wider nonprofit and NGO series of organizations. The ideological um, 
fundament of what we talk about, you know, these kinds of ideas that we explore. It's pretty clear, I think, to you and to me and probably everyone listening that there's not really a space for the expression of these thoughts in those institutions, right? Sure. And so that's actually one of the interesting things about what we're doing. It's like you're, you, your platform is an answer to the very problem you've just asked about. You know what I mean? Because what you're trying to do is actually create a space with, I think, a relief from these marketized pressures. Yes. Whether you're aware of that or not. You probably are aware of it. I certainly see my, my work as trying to do that. And I think what the market does is foment, it foments um, even, even neurobiologically a certain part of our brain, a certain fight or flight response. Um, it activates a certain um, aggression. So it has the affect of aggression that it uh, foments. There's the narcissistic theory of Christopher Lash that I think is sound that it also accelerates. And I think that these create a situation of what I call in a book that I'm working on a type of paternalism. So it creates a kind of pacified subjectivity. Now Sartre would give this the name of the practico inert. Right. Right. Yes. Right. And I actually think there's a lot of value and merit to that of the practico inert, which is, you know, in essence, a kind of, um, well, what he calls the the ground of alienation, right? The ground of alienation and the ground of alienated praxis, right? So institutions take on this passivity um, such that their structures deprive their subjects, deprive the individuals within them. And sometimes the individuals within them know this, sometimes they don't. Um, that's the question of class consciousness, by the way, right? Uh, deprives them of, well, of what Sartre would call praxis, which is kind of like this kind of like practical self-understanding in a certain way. So uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going a, a little far afield from your question, but I think in general, uh, they they do and they don't know. They do and they don't know. You do need psychoanalysis to analyze this. I don't think it's fully an unconscious relation. I do think, though, in a pacified paternalist relation, what's interesting about that is that revolts against it take different forms. And even now, after so many revolts and uprisings have happened in our lifetime, say from like, uh, I don't know, in a long historical arc, uh, from the ultra globalization movement through Occupy, through Black Lives Matter, Palestine, Iraq War. One of the things I'm interested in is sort of uh, how we, how we might uh, uh, analyze the logic of those revolts, and I think that's what Sartre was also very much interested in as well. That's what I'm interested in. Ab exactly. That's what turned me on to his work. Is, that's that's uh, what the critique of dialectical reason is about. Yes, it's about it's about a, a theory of groups. Yes, it's about a theory of groups. You know what he says in the book? Very interestingly, it's a this is a prolegomena to a future anthropology. Yep. So it's a, it's a, it's it's interesting. Also, I was re realizing this recently that Freud's group psychology was also initiated. I don't know if you knew this by events of revolts right the uh, around the time that he wrote this book you had the spartacist uprising around the time that he wrote this you have communist uprisings you had 1917 one of the big figures in behind the scenes that he's critiquing in his group theory of groups what's called group psychology analysis of the ego is gustave Le Bon. Gustave Le Bon was this bourgeois social scientist who tried to create a theory for how to minimize revolts. 
And <laughs> so Freud is kind of saying, no, 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 you're all wrong. He's not necessarily saying revolts are good because he's still a liberal, but he does have a kind of theory of groups that's quite revolutionary. So anyways, this is an interesting side point because I felt like the critique of dialectical reason is kind of like Sartre's equivalent of Freud's group psychology. But um, yeah. I mean, well, I, there's some really interesting stuff in general just about Sartre and psychoanalysis. Uh, um, Betty, I'm trying to remember her name. Uh, I'm going to look it up actually because I think it's that important. I think it's Canton or something. Okay. Well, there's a new there's a new work of a younger scholar. Um, yeah, Betty Cannon. Betty, Go on. Uh, I interviewed her on my show. Uh, who did her dissertation on Sartre's existential psychoanalysis? Um, Mary Robinson. She is based in Ireland, and it's a really nice book. You should have her on your show. Um, it's not an analysis of his famous screenplay on Freud. It's rather an analysis of his two books. One on Janae. I don't know why these balloons did that. I apologize. You I, know, it's, you know it's, it's like your hand gestures, I think, is what causes it. I've been trying to figure that yeah. out for months. Every, I, I, I need to, like, stop it. But um, anyways, um, it's a great book. It's about his studies of Janae and Flaubert. And mm. I think I've read it, of, actually. Okay. Yeah, Sartre's yeah. Existential Psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah, it's very recent. Yeah, yeah cool. um, which and it tackles, you know, tackling Sartre's Flaubert is a mammoth task. It's five volumes; they're very hard to get. It's out of print, and uh, from what I've read of the, of them, they are so fabulous. I must say, it's arguably the 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 project that he spent the most time on yeah in his life he he abandoned critique the critique for it pretty much yeah. right it's a true so, a true achievement yeah um to tie this a little bit into the time period in france you know there's another group that claim you know has a claim to fame about the 68 revolts which is the situationist international and uh, they're right. all you know one of their leading figures, Guy Debor. And I'm sure you know as much as people who are watching this <laughs> and me know. Uh -huh. You know, the Society of the Spectacle had you know, a pretty big uh, impact on at post-68 new left thinking, whether it's anarchist, mm -hmm. Marxist, you know, whatever. And uh, it seems like, you know, that what they do, we know Lefebvre was inf influential on them and on De Boer. Yeah. What about Lukash? Because. Right. That's a very interesting question. And I know that McKinsey Wark has written a book on this interrelationship because I know that one of the consequences of De Boer's reading of history and class consciousness was the extraction of a pessimistic claim because at the core of the society of spectacle is also a pessimistic claim about the collapse and the revolutionary potential of the working class after the Second World War yes. in general, due to the rise of the public relations industries and these media apparatuses and so on. And I and I think, even though I'm not a great Deborist myself, I don't read Debor, it's been a while, but I do know that he derives a claim of of uh in that section on reification from history and class consciousness, this becomes, I think, the fundamental scaffolding by which he understands uh, the process of fetishism and then applies it to the notion of spectacle from that. And I think the other point is that he plays with this uh, category of the totality and argues that the totality, as Lukács theorizes it in history and class consciousness, is now under the autonomy or kind of the purview of the spectacle. So it's again a pessimistic claim on Lukács' thing. And one of the things that 
drives my work when it comes to Lukács, because I'm working on a book on him right now, is that I have this sense, and it's kind of like, as Bed, you would call it, kind of like a philosophical wager, that Lukács's notions in history and class consciousness do in fact stand the test of time. And therefore, these subsidiary technological forms of mediation or power that De Boer might critique or various uh, theories of the changing class composition that, in fact, there still remains something singular in Lukács' proposal, and something necessary in Lukács' proposal from the standpoint of practice. That's one of the arguments that I try to make, that there, we must actually revisit Lukács on different terms than a lot of philosophers have visited him, revisited him. Because like De Boer, he revisits Lukács, but he alternates everything. You know, you know what I mean? You, know what I mean? you kind of uh, read something and you say, well, it's all outmoded, it's brilliant, but I'm going to now uh, make a complete 180 out of everything. For me, there's something uh, more essential, more essential precisely about political organizing, in fact. Because one of the things that I see the task of the left is this institution building task. Mm -hmm. And I see Lukács as a great thinker of institutions, not so much a great thinker of groups. Keep in mind this, and this connects to uh, Deleuze and Guattari, by the way. One of the things I realized in my like third study of anti-Oedipus is that they have a bunch of references in anti-Oedipus to the critique of dialectical reason. Okay. I don't know if you knew that. I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. You know why this is important? Because they allow Sartre's critique to sanction an abandonment of Marxist class theory. And the notion of the groupsicle and the whole idea of Deleuze and Guattari's conception of groups hmm. is building off of a certain reading of the critique of dialectical reason. That makes sense. Okay. And it, a very partial one, yeah. And I think that it's it's another example of, of the wrong reading. Like I was meeting with Ray Brassier recently, and we both agreed that what's actually needed when it comes to the critique of dialectical reason is a new reading of it because sometimes texts, and I think this is an example of one, they don't get a thorough reading and they don't get a reading that is situating them. I think what happened with the critique of dialectical reason is kind of kind of like a, a pass off text and people kind of take little pieces here and there. An, an example there, Bajou. Alain Badiou builds so much of his thought from the critique of dialectical reason, in my view. I've written about I've, this. I've heard that. So I've, much. I've, yeah. For example, we know, for example, this notion of event. I'm not saying that the critique is where Badiou got the idea of the event, but you know this notion that Sartre develops in his section on the French Revolution of the apocalypse? Remember that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is basically kind of like the moment of the storming of the Bastille and the kind of rise of the Jacobins as a, a fused group, what he calls a fused group. Because, you know, Sartre's vision is kind of like this. It's like majority of the time, the social order um, renders all of us inert, passive subjects. That's, that's the status quo. That's seriality, what he calls seriality. Like we have, we attempt for praxis, we attempt for totalization, we attempt to realize ourselves, we attempt to revolt, we fail. The institutions overwhelm us. That's the norm. But groups have a rare moment of a break off and they fuse. And it's always this uh, fusion, which is based on a new pledge, what he calls a new pledge that would be. Uh, forging a different norm to the bourgeois norm or the dominant norm, right? And by the way, Terry Pinkard 
develops this in great detail. Uh, but the problem with this eventual emergence that forms the pledge of the fused group is that they create a kind of contract with each other based on scarcity and that is based on conditions which they struggle to last. So it becomes a problem of fidelity. And that's actually why I think that Beju has this virtue of fidelity. Yeah, he says it's about 68 and his concrete experiences in 68 to always remember the fidelity of that revolutionary moment. But that's actually part of what Sartre calls forth in a new understanding of revolutionary history, which is how, the, uh, in other words, the task after reading the critique is to ask yourself, how can groups remain in fidelity to the outlaw formation that they create? To the fused group that they create you know what i'm saying yes and sartre gives a kind of pessimistic answer which is that well uh uh, uh the rivalries he puts a big focus on the rivalries they try fraternity but they're overwrought by rivalries most often right i mean that's the other thing you could do if you wanted to really be a sartrean is you could go back in history and anthropology and study uh and this is what Badju does by the way Okay, there's another reason why he's Sartrean. What does Bad Jew do in Logics of Worlds? He gives a number of examples of past revolutions of fused groups, and he shows in careful detail where they went, where their directions went, how they failed, how they succeeded, etc. So, so anyways, just a little little example. Yeah, um, Badu is someone I have not been able to uh, to get myself to read yet. He is. Yeah. I know it's going to require a significant amount of uh, commitment in order to even get through being an event. And what is he on? Like volume four or something is coming out or three or. Yeah. So we have. Uh, if you want to start with Badu. Um, you can start with being an event, and then you can go to uh, volume two, which is called Logics of Worlds. And there's a number of short ancillary texts, like the Manifesto for Philosophy 1 and 2, um, a number of, uh, you know, his, his work on ethics is probably, if you really want to start fresh, go read his, his text called Ethics, which was just a lecture given to high school students. Um, and that really introduces some of his core, his core, uh, political vision, the singularity of his visions on communism in our time, etc. Then there is imminence of truth. So technically there's only three installments. Uh, there will not be a fourth. Okay. There will not be a fourth. No. So it's technically complete. Um, it is very robust. It is uh, probably the most significant philosophical intervention of our time, in my opinion. Well, not, for me, the hard part is uh, getting over my uh, aversion to math and set theory. Yeah, that's hard. And yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard. But, um, I mean, I yeah, I, we could talk about that at a later time. But that's a that is difficult. I acknowledge that. He's very sure. good at it, though. With uh, like helping you along to learn the basics. So it's worth it. So I think I got a last question that we could try to wrap things up sure. with. Um, Sartre centers the problem of the Marxism of his time as being one of basically leaving out praxis as at the, at the center of the dialectic, right? It sounds like, Lukash has a similar diagnosis uh, from what you're telling me. Do, do you think that is still an issue today? Do you think the diagnosis was correct <laughs> at the time to begin with? And um, I know we're already getting into talking about this uh, desire to, you know, this institution orient, institution building orientation as a form of praxis yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go on. 
Great question. I, I think that um, there's a vulgar way to answer this, which would be that like Zizek is wrong. This is a vulgar way uh, where like Zizek says we need to invert uh, thesis 11 and emphasize contemplation over action. Largely, I think to be charitable to him, he says that because action is subordinated to liberalism by and large. So there's a certain truth to that. In other words, uh, what's the meaning of, of, of thoughtless action? Yeah. On the, on the flip side of that, uh, as Sartre, I think, uh, defines praxis, right? He defines praxis differently than does Lukács because he defines praxis as a, uh, a more permanent and continuous uh, struggle for an achievement of practical self-understanding that never materializes, right? That always gets subordinated back into the practical inert of bourgeois institutions, etc. but yet still nonetheless, people revolt. One of the things that Sartre says that Marxism needs to focus on is the understanding of the human from the standpoint of needs. Yeah. And he believes that Marx's materialism was most correct when it emphasizes not consciousness as a pure abstract thought category, but rather need. And that's actually why oftentimes Sartre doesn't talk about the working class, but he talks about the underprivileged and those low, the lower un part of that is colored by his experience with Algeria. Mm -hmm. Part of that is colored by the rigidity and the class reductionism of certain form of French Stalinism, which uh, imbued the working class in the way that they did as uh, never to be an heir. So they made a kind of vulgar uh, social ontology of the working class that was self-righteous. So, uh, yeah. but, but on Lukács' side, praxis is transformative at the level of consciousness for sure. But where Sartre is wrong to criticize Lukács as only possessing a theory of revolutionary class consciousness and leaving it at that, in other words, he says that Sartre has no emphasis on enjoyment, desire, need, the body, etc. right? Uh, in some sense, I think that that's an unfair treatment. Okay. Precisely because uh, it's not it's not that Lukács dismisses this domain of social reality or of subjective life. No, in fact, through Lukács's extensive study of literature, he develops a. Uh, a very sophisticated idea of aesthetics and affect and so on and even the body and so on i think rather the better way to understand lukács's contributions to politics is that is a very very like uh, strategic lenin he's one of the best readers of lenin that's another important thing to understand here is that sartre wavers i think from this Leninist tradition. Leninism is a political strategy. Leninism is about achieving concrete political objectives. You know what I mean? It's revolutionary strategy. Right. Now, now um, so therefore, uh, I felt that in the essay that Sartre wrote for New Left Review or the lecture, he was falsely depicting Lukács' theory of class consciousness as reliant on what he calls 
a class consciousness of truth or falsity, or it's kind of like this reductive, and that's that's actually a caricature, because I already defined irrationalism as something far beyond merely like a break from sufficient reason or something like this, or like um, true consciousness, false. It's not, it's not this binary. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's much more involved than that. So, so, um, so praxis is revolutionary for both thinkers. It is revolutionary. They both have a very different account of how class emerges. They have a different account of class composition they have a different account of the priority of the working class. I don't think that look that Sartre, while both have a very interesting idea of the determination, the necessary determination of class being and class experience. For example, Sartre will say things like uh, the class being almost determines one's own um, consciousness in certain instances. And he gives examples of this, how one um, faces uh, the failure of praxis because of class oppression in some ways. Yet at the same time, in a revolutionary valence, Sartre does not have the same uh, strategic focus that Lukács does. So perhaps that would be my answer is that Lukács is a better strategist of class and revolution. Sartre is a better thinker at a more granular um, materialist level regarding subjectivity. Um, and that's actually why I think the later Sartre, as he turns to the Flaubert study, uh, provides us with this um, full scope of the constitution of subjectivity and social life. So in that sense, Lukács' critique of Sartre and of phenomenology writ large from whatever, the 1950s, well, by the time later, Sartre, you could never make the same critique because Sartre's right. social analysis so advanced, so in depth, you know. So uh, those are some those are some thoughts. Now, I mean, for me, praxis. Those are some thoughts on those two thinkers. I love putting them together in dialogue. By the way, um, praxis is essential. I mean, in the sense that, as as a practical political education, for me, education is praxis. Um, I see Jared our situation as one of. Um, a lot of anti-intellectualism, in fact. So I don't really make a distinction between reading Marxists and non-reading Marxists. Both reading Marxists and non-reading Marxists are engaged in praxis. Reading is a form of praxis as well. Um, so I, I don't really, I don't know if I agree with this strong distinction between like um, contemplation and action, you know, they're always meant to be dialectically fused. Okay. <laughs> How about you? How about you? Uh, I don't know my Marxism well enough to be able to tell if Sartre is giving a fair diagnosis of like, the Marxism of his time, I think, targeting Althusser or, you know, whoever was uh, a leading thinker of French Marxism in, uh, in, in that time. So, yeah, I'm, that's why I'm so curious about that question, because it when I, you mm. know, my engagement with Marxism has almost always been through people who begin with the young Marx and the question of alienation where you do have praxis as being a really important part of it. And it just seems very, uh, he might've froze. Oh no, you didn't. Um, oh no, no, it I was seems, listening. Yeah, listening it intensely. Seems, 
it seems like another world where you would have the Stalinist uh, diamet, you know, dialectical materialism, diamat, that would like, you know, shy away from anything to do with subjectivity, anything to do with praxis, and yeah. try to have an has this idealist view in the way Sartre describes it. That's true. I mean, yeah, to to say that praxis is central for him is proven by the intervention, the two volume intervention of the critique. Uh, it's all, and that's his answer in some ways, as I see it, you know? And, uh, and I think that he really, I think one of the things that he did was he really, uh, molded and transformed the direction that Marxist theoretical study had took ever since its intervention, not only in France, but beyond. You know what I think his most important praxis was is uh, his, his editing Le Temps Modern, Modern Times. Mm. And I think that to bring people as disparate as M Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Raymond Aron into a conversation under, you know, uh, into that magazine is just there is something to me that was historical about that in a way that yeah. his specific writing is not. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think that's, yeah. It's, it's huh. hard to say his, his uh, most essential contribution. There's so many, but, um, yeah, it's true. no, I mean, I love this provocation that you gave me to think Sartre with Lukács uh clearly uh i mean we we should ask why so little has been done on it uh and i'm happy that we that we broached it because it's it's a great project really yeah i i look forward well first of all i look forward to your book that you're thank you. in the process thank of you. of writing yeah uh, thank you and yeah, you know, there's a lot, you know, you've put out so much good stuff uh, that I have yet to catch up on. So I'll be doing some of that going into the future. Well, thanks for having me on this wonderful show. And I really enjoyed the time. And um, I hope folks got some good reading recommendations and some, maybe even some insight. Likewise. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to end the recording, make sure to get, you know, all the contact info. I got your link tree, but anything you want to uh, to have in the show description, I'll definitely have in there. But uh, yeah, okay, thank you great. for coming on. It's my pleasure. All the best. I wish you all the best. Thank you.